Rebbe, they all made a Shachianu. And the previous Rebbe said that he's the one who should be making a Shachianu to see such a family come out. And they were set up in the joint in New Jersey. That's how it worked in those days. They were given a farm. They were set up shop. And he used to come into Brooklyn once a week to, to see the previous Rebbe, to, to hear a Hasidic Mimer. And when he came in one week, the previous Rebbe told him, why don't you have a Ein Yaakov shear, a class in Ein Yaakov, for all the Jewish farmers in the surrounding area in New Jersey? The previous Rebbe wasn't randomly telling him to do that. This was what was done. This is how it worked in Eastern Europe. This is how it was done for so many hundreds of years. And it's unfortunate that for some reason, it, in a way, it's become lost. And as if the masses, their main study is supposed to be complex, intricate, halachic sugyas in the Gemara, when really they're supposed to learn Gemara in a way that will change their life. And it's not the parts of the Gemara which are referred to as Agadita, the Ein Yaakov, it's not less than the part of the Gemara of Halacha. It's just as much of Taira as part of Taira as anything else. And even more so because it says in the Kabbalah that most of the secrets of the Taira, the inner secrets are all contained in the Agadita, in the Ein Yaakov. That's where they, when they want to hide the secrets of the Taira, when they want to hide all the Kabbalistic teachings, that is where it is placed. So that's why it is so important to do in Yaakov. So that's in way of introduction um, uh, of what we're exactly we're learning. Now open on your page. I hope you're able to see it. You should be able to. Last week one or two people had a problem of seeing it. So let me know if you don't see it. But on your page right now you should be seeing uh, this is from the website Sfari. If you want to have the Gemara itself you can have it. It's from Baba Basra, Daf Yud, Ahmad Aleph, 10a, and the topic under discussion in this Gemara was all about Staka. It was all about Staka. And we had already, and this is where we were holding it, exactly where I have the page right now. It says the following It is taught in a Braisa. A Braisa is from the rabbis of the time of the Mishnayot. The Mishnayot was completed in the year 190 something, approximately around the year 200 essentially. It was completed and edited, the Mishnah. All the rabbis before that time, for the 200-year period before that time, are referred to as the Tanoim, and they wrote their texts. Their texts were called Braises. If it didn't make it into the main text called the Mishnah, then it was called the Braises. But it's essentially the same rabbis from that period of time. And that is the main body, of course, of Torah Shabal Peh, of the oral teaching of the Torah of the Jewish people, which was recorded in the Talmud. So this is what it says. It was taught in a Braises. The Rabbi Elazar, the son of Rabbi Yaisi, said, All acts of charity and kindness, call in the Hebrew, called Staka Vachesed, that the Jewish people do in this world, Shalim Gadol, great peace, Upraklitin Gdailim, and great um, lawyers between the Jewish people and their father in heaven. And it brings a proof from the prophet Jeremiah, the prophet, Kayamar Hashem, so says the Lord. Hashem gave a prophecy to Jeremiah, the prophet, that, he should, that before the exile happens, he should already live as if, as if it took place, as if the destruction took place already. And the way he was supposed to do that is, God told him, enter not into a house of mourning. In other words, nowadays in a time of peace, it's a big deal when someone passes away. So everyone goes to Menachem Mavl, you sit Shiva, God forbid. But when uh, when everyone's dying, it's no big deal. No one, no one, no one sits shiva. So Hashem already told Jeremiah the prophet to already begin living as if the destruction happened already. So he told him, enter not into a house of mourning. Don't, don't lament. Don't bemoan them. And then Hashem said the following words: Ki asafti es shloimi For I have removed. I have taken away my peace from this people. Says the Lord, kindness and mercy. Which, of course, if you read the verse, it's a little bit funny because you're dividing it up. Hashem says, I removed my peace from this people, says the Lord, kindness and, and compassion and mercy. Why is it dividing it? So, the way he's reading the Gemara, the way he's reading this Pasuk, the way this Tana, the way this rabbi is reading the Pasuk is 
I'm going to re- remove my shalom, my peace from this people, from the Jewish people. Namely, what is my peace? Kindness and mercy. In other words, when, and the Gemara now spells it out, chesed goes on gemilos chasadim, and mercy goes on tzedakah. Acts of kindness and charity. Acts of kindness, the difference is, there's a number of differences, but generally speaking, acts of kindness can be done to even a person who is wealthy, and tzedakah is to a poor person. But generally, chesed and rachamim. Kindness and compassion. Kindness is acts of kindness, and compassion is staka. So that's what it means in the Pasuk, that Hashem says that why am I going to remove my peace from this people? Because chesed and rachamim is removed. What, does, what is the implication that he's trying to learn from this? That when Jews have chesed and rachamim, when Jews are doing staka of chesed, kindness and mercy, then Hashem says, there is shalom, you have my peace. You have shalom, gadol, to use the word great peace, who praklit in gadolim. Before we move to the next piece of Gemara, right, this, uh, what, uh, by the way, if anyone has a thought, question, comment, don't be shy. Don't be shy. Please join the conversation. Um, you know, it seems to be, okay, it seems to be a nice teaching, but it doesn't seem to have, what, what is the depth behind this teaching? What's the statement being made? So there's, I've seen a number of commentaries with a number of comments. I'm gonna mention one or two or three of them. The, the most basic level of explanation of this Gemara is that it says that Hashem takes shaykha, that Hashem takes bribery. What is the bribery that he takes? Staka, tshuva, and good deeds. And the question is asked, why is it called bribery? What, what's, what, you're bribing God, and if it is bribery, why does God take bribery? He takes bribery not to punish you. We know the Jewish people believe in reward and punishment. What is reward and punishment? Reward and punishment is that any good thing that we've done in our entire lives is going to be rewarded. There's not a single thought, speech, or action that we have which is positive will not be rewarded. And there is not a single thought, speech, or action which of a negative thought, speech, or action which is not going to be punished. There's no such thing as something gets lost. Nothing gets lost. Every conversation we ever had, anything we ever did, it's all part of the cheshman. Everything is there. So, and this is a fundamental belief in Judaism. It's actually one of the 13 principles of faith. So, what, so what's the concept of sheikhan? So it's explained that Hashem could judge with the attribute of mercy or with the attribute of judgment. Kindness, chesed v'rachamim, kindness and compassion, or judgment. And the difference is the glasses, how you do, how you do it. If you judge with compassion and with mercy, then even the sin, you could find justification. Of course, it's not justified, but you could say what led the person to do the sin you could see things from their perspective. You could find mitigating factors. If the person did the commandments not so perfect, you could still find meritorious elements in what they have done. Versus when you're looking with judgment, that even the positive things we do, they could be judged. Was it, self, was it selfishly motivated? Was it done meticulously? Was it like a body without a soul? Was it dead? All the, the things which don't seem like a sin could be a sin. It says in comparison to God, even the highest, no one emerges meritorious from the judgment of God. And essentially what the Gemara is saying is a very simple concept, which is that one of the most fundamental principles of an, uh, in the Gemara, in the Talmud, of how God runs this world is Mida Keneged Mida. Measure for measure. The way you act is the way you, will, you are going to be treated. So it's to simply put, if a Jew lives their life with, what was the words of the Gemara, of, doing, of living their life of stuck of a chesed, stuck of a chesed, then the response is that Hashem says, I am going to act with you the same way that you act that you acted. 
Were you so judgmental of your fellow Jew? Did you, did you play the blame game that you shouldn't be helping him because why doesn't he help himself? Did you, uh, do you sit there in judgment? Do you think that you're superior to that person? Do you think you deserve more than that person, than your fellow Jew? And so on and so forth. The whole approach that you have with your fellow Jew, are you finding, are you, are you justifying your fellow Jew? Or are you blaming? Are you looking for critique, for negativity, and so on? You know, we're, in a way, we're entitled to live that way, but don't, but don't, you know, you know what they say. They say you're free to choose as you please, but you're not free for the consequences of those choices. You're absolutely free. You can do it. It's a free country, and it's a free, uh, and not only it's a free country, it's a free world. Hashem gave us Bechir HaKavshiz. But the, the concept that we are mentioning right now is the Midah connected Midah. And therefore, the Gemara says that a person, that the Jews do in this world, that creates shalim gadol, abundance of peace, between us and Hashem. It's the ultimate lawyer that, will, that could intercede on our behalf and say that we acted against our own self-interest sometimes. We overlooked offense and so on and so forth. And we didn't, uh, we didn't get stuck in a fight. We didn't get stuck in judgment. And so too, we ask Hashem that you, and this indeed creates the reality of Shalim Gadol Uprakhlitim Zaylam. That's one layer on a very simple, basic level. I'm going to mention one other level, and then we'll move on to the next piece of the bar. And the other idea is that in general, we came into this world, part of the purpose of creation of the world is to become a partner with God in creation. In the words of the Gemara elsewhere, to be a shutaf lahakadish baruchu b'maisi to be a partner with God in creation. In creation. To be a giver, not to be a receiver. God is the ultimate giver. God is the creator. The, ult, the, 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 the primary word that's used for God is bayre, is creator. The relationship with you have is, is the creator, which means that the ultimate act of God is in our world is the act of tzedakah, Hashem's tzedakah. The whole world is one big act of tzedakah. We never earned it. We were just born. We were given the gift of life because Hashem wanted to give us the gift of life. The whole world is a world of tzedakah. And what it means to partner with Hashem in creation is just like Hashem is a giver and not a taker, just like Hashem gives unconditionally, we emulate our Creator and Hashem allows us to be the giver. And that's why the ultimate mitzvah in the Torah is the mitzvah tzedakah. Because that is our way of partnering with God in creation. Last time we learned, we actually learned that Hashem gives the money to the poor person through you. You are that person. You have their money in your pocket. You are the one who gives them. You're their source because you are acting as a partner with God in creation. And this accomplishes the Shalim Gadol, the peace between Yisrael, Avi, and Shabbat between the Jewish people and their Father in Heaven, like it says in the Gemara. Because it says that the purpose of creation, the purpose of the Torah, I'm sorry, was the whole purpose of the Torah was to create peace in the world. And that means, that's a statement brought down in many places, primarily the Rambam, Maimonides. And on a simple level, we could say that it's here to make peace on all the layers of reality, to bring it all together. Shalim, the Shalim really means that you take two opposites and you bring them together. You make peace between two things which are in conflict, which are separate from each other. That's what peace means. And peace doesn't mean a ceasefire, by the way. Peace, does, peace means that they actually unite. And that's what Shalim means. And it says, and so on one layer, the purpose of the Torah is to, is to bring peace between mankind and between God to bring heaven down to earth, to break down the distinction between the physical and the spiritual, 
And that's the mission of a Jew, that we take our lives, our physical businesses, and, and, and we make everything holy. We make everything a place where God feels at home. And that bridges the gap, that brings Shalem into the world. And within the mitzvahs, when we emulate God, and we become God-like through tzedakah of chesed, that is the ultimate shalim, which is why the whole Torah that Rambam says is here to bring shalim to the world. But staka, being that it's the ultimate way that we can emulate God, that's why it adds an extra word. Shalim gadol, great shalim. And it fulfills this idea and this purpose. I will just add that it's interesting to note that our generation is the lowest generation in Jewish history in terms of spiritual sensitivity and, uh, and, and feeling and awareness and connection. But yet there's one thing that our generation excels in perhaps more than any other generation in Jewish history. Staka. There's never been so much staka in the history of the Jewish people. You might argue that Jews never had so much money, but still, this is something that this is our generation's mission. This is something very unique. And ultimately, like we're going to learn in a moment, very soon, this is actually what brings Mashiach to Stucco. So this is the first piece of Gemara that we have learned today. Now let's move on to the continuation of the Gemara. Um, the continuation is like this. It was taught in a Brisa that Rabbi Yehuda said, Rabbi Yehuda, of course, we know is the author of the editor-in-chief of the Mishnah, the greatest rabbi of his generation. So Rabbi Huda said, greatest charity that advances the redemption. This Hebrew line is very, very famous. It brings, the, it brings Mashiach closer. It brings Apostle from Isaiah the prophet. We read it on fast days. Do justice and do tzedakah. Guard justice, uphold justice and do tzedakah. Because my salvation is near and my righteousness is going to be revealed. And the way he's reading the verse is, do tzedakah because my salvation is near. How is he reading the passage the verse? He's reading it that the giving of the tzedakah makes that the salvation should be near. So do tzedakah because when you do tzedakah, the salvation is going to be near. But in any event, he says that there's nothing that brings Mashiach more than tzedakah. Which goes to the point that I was saying before, that our generation, how are we going to be the generation who's going to merit the coming of Mashiach, the ultimate, the final generation of history as we know it. We're the transition. There's never been a generation like ours. We're a transitional generation. We're the last generation of Golos, of the, of the old order, and the first generation of the new order, of Mashiach. Why are we going to merit? So the typical answer, of course, that we're like midgets on, on giant shoulders. We have the accomplishment of all of our ancestors, and it's just us, our job, we clinch the mission. We're the final generation. We're that generation who pulls it off in the end. But then there's another aspect, which Rabbi Huda says right here. Rabbi Huda says that Stokka particularly is what brings the Gula. Why particularly that Stokka brings the Gula? So we mentioned before that it, that it, that it, uh, you know, it, can, it makes us godlike and so on. But the problem with our, the problem with saying that for us is that there are other things that make us less godlike. So that can't be the ultimate explanation for why this would be the real uh, clincher that is going to bring Mashiach, going to bring the Gula. And the real explanation is, like we mentioned before is that a Jew's mission is to take all the sparks of holiness in this world, everything he comes in contact with, and to lift it up and make it a place where Hashem feels at home. A beautiful dwelling place for Hashem. That's the purpose of creation. And there's nothing like giving tzedakah which elevates it, the most elevation of the world, the greatest amount of the world that is elevated is through tzedakah. Because tzedakah takes up most of our adult lives, it take, I'm sorry, parnasa, earning money, takes up most of our adult lives. It, it, it takes up most of our energy. And all of that energy is uplifted, is given to God, essentially, 
with the portion of charity of 10% or 20%, whatever it is, that we give to Tzaka, that takes all of that accomplishment, all of those business dealings, all of those countries, all of those transactions, everything that we're involved with and gives that all to Hashem. And therefore, being that it has that power, that's why this particularly has the, uh, the strength and the oomph that it could bring Mashiach. Because it lifts up so many sparks and it captures so much of our world and offers it to Hashem. The ultimate ego symbol, the dollar, you give it to Hashem. There's a question that's asked by the commentaries. If you look in the verse, it doesn't just mention stuck, it also mentions justice. So why does Rabbi Yehuda only say, that stuck is what brings the gu'ula, brings redemption. Why not justice also? And the, the commentaries explain that, if, that if, when you study the verse in context, it's saying it's all about tzedaka. What it's saying, however, is that tzedaka, which you do not earn justly, is not a merit for you. It doesn't bring any goodness, any kindness, any... Uh, there's no Robin Hoods in Judaism. You don't steal from other people and give away their money. That's not a merit. It doesn't bring anything closer. It doesn't bring you close, closer to God. It doesn't bring anyone closer to God. It's a waste of time, in, in, in moral terms at least. It's, a, it's an either neutral or negative. That, it's still, that's what it's saying. Shimru Mishpat. Make sure that the money that you're earning is earned justly, correctly, honestly. And then you give that stock uh, away to the Eberster to, to, to give that money to the stock and so on. But if it's not earned justly, then, it, then, then of course Judaism has no uh, patience for that. And in fact, one of the seven mitzvahs, one of the seven Oahid laws, essentially is respect for private property. And like we know, if any of the seven Noahid laws is not believed by society in general, it means it's the collapse of that society. That's why we have seven. There's, there's many more moral obligations and imperatives on non-Jews. Just seven things. The reason why we have these seven, point, what's special about these seven is that if you remove any of the seven, the whole structure collapses. There cannot be a human civilization without these seven laws. That's why Hashem gave these laws in particular, and these are uncompromising. These can never be compromised. And without them, the game is up. So, so this is a general concept, it's very foundational, that the money you're earning you can't be you just steal the money. The money has to be earned fair and square. And then you give that money to Tzedakah. You give that money to Tzedakah. Um, Continue for a second. Any thoughts, questions, comments? Okay. So now, it goes on to a um, to something which is not directly about Tzedakah. And we're going to get back to Tzedakah because this page of Gemara happens to be the first chapter of Baba Bas has a lot to say about Tzedakah. And that field is all about stucca. But however, the Gemara is wont to do this. The Gemara does this commonly. That once it brings a statement of a certain rabbi, it, 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 it brings another statement from that same rabbi. Hu haya Omer, he used to say, or something of that nature. And of course, there are commentaries who make connections why this particular statement is brought over here. But that's what happens now in the Gemara. And this is a very, very mysterious Gemara. I was doing research in this piece of Gemara. I have a database, a special thing that you buy with a few hundred thousand Jewish uh, holy books, you know, from over the years from, from, from uh, the Jewish people. We've been around for a while. And I was researching this, uh, this little piece of Gemara and I was, uh, it, was, it was fascinating to see how many dozens of ways of learning it and books and, and, and things were written on this. I wasn't even aware that there was so much written on this. But, uh, so let's see what it is. Let's see what it says. And maybe, and we'll mention uh, one shot that caught my eye. That caught my eye. He used to say, he would say, 
Rabbi Huda Nasi would say, There are 10 strong entities created in the world. A mountain is strong. A mountain not made of uh, mud, made of, uh, of, uh, of uh, rock, strong rock. But iron is stronger. It cleaves it, it breaks it. Iron is strong, but fire melts it. Fire, if it's a high, high enough temperature, it could smelt it, it could turn it into liquid. Fire is strong, but water extinguishes it. Water is strong and powerful, but clouds bear it. Clouds could, could carry, and you see when it rains and a serious storm, clouds could contain hundreds of thousands and even millions of gallons of water, which is an incredible thing to think about. Clouds are strong, but winds disperse them. Wind is strong, but the human body withstands it. You have to think about what that means. But it's basically saying that the human body contains this oxygen and it doesn't, uh, doesn't, doesn't, uh, it works out very well with the person. With all the holes in their body, it somehow works it out, works out well. I'm not an, I'm not an architect, so I didn't understand it exactly, but I was reading a, from a, uh, one of these journals of, uh, of a religious, uh, scientist i guess or architect and he was discussing this piece of gemara and i didn't understand what he said exactly but something about how how the particles of the wind um they're actually much stronger than the air itself of oxygen of the ear is actually very thick in fact it's so strong apparently according to what he wrote that it could hold up a tunnel it could hold up many things in architecture it holds it up and yet, we as humans, we as people are able to walk right through it. And, uh, and it doesn't have that resistance and so on. So I'm not going to delve into this because I don't understand enough about it. But an interesting thought. As, as I mentioned before, there's so many pshat, so many explanations of this Gemara. And most of them are not literally just sitting there on the literal level. But like many things in Judaism, there's also truth on the literal level. And then, of course, there's so many deeper levels. Like we mentioned in the outset, it says in the Kabbalah that most of the secrets of the Kabbalah are not contained in the halacha part of the Gemara, but are contained in the Agadita. So this would have a lot of secrets of the Torah. Anyways, he goes on. The human body is strong. By the way, the word that is used in English, it's translating strong. But if you look at the Hebrew, the word is kashim or kasheh. I don't know if that, I don't know if I would translate the word kasha as strong. It means hard. Maybe it means resilient. Kasha. Like a kasha means I have a difficult question. So it says, goof kasha. The body is strong, but fear breaks it. Fear breaks the body. It breaks the body. Fear is a very strong factor. I think we're living, unfortunately, in a time where we have a lot of fear in people. People are fearful. People believe everything they hear. People, people are fearful. There's a fear in their eyes. But in any event, but of course there's fear and then there's real fear. I don't, know if the, I don't know if we're at the real fear nowadays, but fear breaks a person. Fear is strong. Pachat is strong. Wine dispels it. Wine is strong. Sleep is able to uh, minimize its effect. And umisa kashamikulam, death is stronger than all of them. And then concludes the Gemara, which of course is, is we don't need to look why this Gemara is brought down here. He concludes, Staka Matzelis Menamisa, and Staka is stronger than death, because it says with Staka Tatsumi Mavis. Staka saves from death. That's the Gemara. That's the Gemara. Your thoughts, if anybody has a thought. First of all, the commentaries ask, 
he began by saying, As sort of that's the Gemara. That's the Gemara. First of all, the commentary is asked that there's actually a body law. There's 10 hard things which uh, exist in the world. But over here, we have 11 things. So the Marsha's explanation is he says that actually the reason why sleep is very potent is because the Gemara says that it's 1 60th of death. And therefore, by definition, there is actually no distinction. Death and sleeping is the same one. On the contrary, it's really death, which is very uh, strong, a very powerful force in the world. And sleep, being that it contains some of death, it has power to it as well. That would, so that's why you have 10, not 11. The Iyun Yaakov has a different shot, and what he says, he says, if you look at the words of the Gemara, it says, Asadat Varam Kashem Nivru Ba'elam, were created in the world. In other words, all 10 things are needed for the continuation of the world. They all serve a purpose. They all have a positive contribution to the world. And even fear has a positive contribution. It says in the Pasik, Ashre Ish Bifachet Tamid. It says in the verse, fortunate is the person who is. Who, is, who, who has a fear with them. It's good to have some, some fear in a person's life. However, death has no possible explanation. Death is not a positive force in the world. Death is all negative. Death is all negative. And, and, that's, and by the way, that's why we, don't, we can't make peace with death. If you think about it, it actually doesn't make too much sense because there's... Uh, everyone dies everyone who's ever lived in the history of the world has died you go back you watch a video from a hundred years ago you see a bustling crowd of millions of people walking around everyone is dead someone's pointing uh, three fingers to me that there's a couple of people who didn't die that's correct there's a handful of people in history who have not died Chanoich, Eliyahu ben Levi But everyone else died. So what? It should take us a while. We should think about it. And the reason is because it's man on the outset of the first man of the mission was programmed to live forever. Because if we're connected to God, then just like Hashem is eternal, that we, we have a connection to that eternity. And death is an unnatural consequence of sin. And therefore, being we, and we feel in our gut, the masses know that it's not supposed to be this way. We always know that it's fundamentally wrong, that it goes against, it goes against the world, it goes against the way it's supposed to be. And therefore, that's why we never make peace with that. And that's what the Mefetish explains that ten Dvarim Kashim or Nibru Ba'elam in the world. This is not something which is in the world. Um, the uh, is an interesting story, and someone tried reconstructing it. But the, basically, in the early days of Hasidism, the uh, Hasidim used to like pretending like they were ignorant, and then showing that they were not ignorant, and uh, in order to bring people to the world of Hasidus. It was a lot of interesting stories. It's going back 250 years ago. So one of the big students of the Baal Shem Tev, of the Toldus Yaakov Yasef, was called the Goyen from uh, Shpitipki. I don't know the, it's the name of the city or something, I guess, in Ukraine. And he came to the Neut Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yehuda Landau of, uh, of Prague, I think. And it got into a discussion. They had a whole back and forth. That we know the Neut Yehuda was not pro the Baal Shem Tev, let's say. He wasn't for the Hasidic movement. And the man said, you know, do you know the sugya, the, the, the Talmudic dialogue of this Gemara and of the Gemara that we just read, the 10 Baran Kashan, the 10 hard things. So all the students of the Nei Devi Huda began to laugh because you only use the word sugya on a difficult passage, on a Talmudic passage. You don't use the word sugya on some simple piece of Gemara, of Agadita. And he said, I don't know why you're laughing. Let me tell you about this Gemara. 
And he ended up going on a pilpul, which he said for 10 days. It took him 10 days to say over on this piece of Gemara. He said a 10, a 10 day uh, thing on this Gemara. And he basically explained how each piece of Gemara was actually discussing a different piece of Talmud and saying that another piece of Talmud answers the question on that piece of Talmud. And then another piece of Talmud, but then you have new questions on that. And then you have another piece of Talmud which answers the questions on this. And we know a few of the sugyas of the pieces of Talmud that he says it's going on. And, uh, and there are those who've tried, being that we don't really have it in completion, or very, we just have the story with a few details. There are people who have attempted to reconstruct it and so on. So that's a very exciting endeavor. I just wanted to share that so that we should realize what we're dealing with when we're dealing with the Gemara. The Gemara is the wisdom of God Almighty himself, is the infinite light of Hashem um, in this world. And now this concept being discussed in this Gemara, of course, is a, is, is a fa- we've seen this concept before, many of us, Judaism. We know that the debates, for example, that Avram Avinu, the first Jew, had with Nimrod in Mesopotamia. He famously, Nimrod told Abraham, Avram, he said, we should bow down to the fire. So Avram told him that we should bow down to the water, which puts out the fire. As he said, he said, we should bow down to the, to the water. So he says, we should bow down to the cloud, which, which carries the water. Bow down to the cloud. He said, bow down to the wind, which scatters the cloud. Bow down to the wind. He says, we should bow down to people who are able to fear the wind. We sing the song of Chadgadia on Pesach, which has some similar theme. But what does it mean on a deeper level? So I'm going to say one uh, shot that I saw, one explanation out of many. And, uh, and we'll see if we could take something, a lesson, as we wrap up tonight's class. Um, something from, uh, from how to serve God and how to live our lives and be better people. So the way it was explained is that it's actually going, what is the difficult thing in this world? It's the Yetzirah. It's our evil inclination. It's the things which are pulling us down and not allowing our souls to soar and for us to be positive and contributing members of society who really make a difference and, and help other people and do what we're supposed to do and live, and live to our potential in this world. And the Gemara says in, in the tractate of Sukkah, famously, that when Mashiach comes, Hashem is going to show us the Yetzirah outside of ourselves. And it says that those who are righteous, it's going to look to them like a mountain. And they're going to weep and say, how was I able to overcome this such a powerful force? Look at this mountain. And it says for those who failed, for the, for the wicked, it's going to seem to them like these little thin strings of the, of, and, they're going to, and they're going to cry and say, I wasn't able to overcome the string. What's the big deal? And it's explained, which one is it really, though? Is the Yetzirah a mountain or a string? And the answer is that it's both are true. The Yetzirah is actually a mountain. But as long as you fight the mountain, even if you just fight the amount of a chut hasayda, the here's breath, the amount of a the strip of the mountain, Hashem helps you. Therefore, once you begin a little bit, don't expect to conquer the whole thing in a second. But you're on your mission to conquer the mountain. And therefore, you conquer a little bit of the mountain and more, and Hashem helps you, and then you'll conquer the entire mountain. So the very first, so the general, this is the general look of the Yitzhahara, and that's the first thing that he brings down in the Gemara. When he says, what did he say in the Gemara? He said that great is the mountain. However, however, barzal that a person should take the approach and realize that you just have to cut out the mountain a little bit. And you're able to cut out a little bit of the mountain. That much you know. And that's how you're going to beat the mountain. Then he goes on and says a, a more particular things, challenges that people that's general, and then it boils down to, 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 to a particular argument that the Yitzhahara makes. So he says, Barzel is a difficult thing. Iron is a difficult thing. Elsewhere in the Talmud, the Yitzhahara is referred to as iron. Why? Because many times we see a challenge, and it looks to us to be a wall of iron. And we, don't, we think to ourselves, there's no way I could overcome this particular challenge. This particular mitzvah is never going to happen in my lifetime. I am not capable. I don't see how I'm ever going to complete this task. It's too great for me. 
And that's the challenge. But the truth is that the, the reason why you have that, this perspective is because you're being weighed down, weighed down by laziness, by atzlos. And if a person would realize that, they'd actually discover that it's not, it's not something, it's, it, it is surmountable, which is why he says that it's true that barzel, iron is very difficult challenge, but fire could melt it, meaning the fire of Toyota. You have to bring the passion and the fire of Toyota. That's why it's so important to have classes like this to give yourself the fire of Toyota to overcome those challenges. Then it says there's the fire could be very difficult. What does that mean? That the Yitzhahara could fill up your heart with desire for certain things like a fire, like a burning flame. You're filled up. Your blood rushes. You're filled up with desire. There's an amazing story in the Gemara, in Kedushin, of a rabbi by the name of Amram who was living in an apartment with two other women on the other floor, like a separate apartment, but they had a door which connected the two. And the Amram was overcome with the desire to, you know, to be with them or something like that. And he started climbing up the ladder and those, those, those days, it was uh, two floors. That's how floors were made. He's climbing up the ladder. And he's halfway up the ladder. He stops for a second and he starts screaming. And he says, Nura be Amram, Nura be Amram, which means there's a fire in the house of Amram. There's a fire in the house of Amram. Which, of course, everyone heard. In those days, you heard of a fire. Everyone came running and his students came running. And they saw everything that happened because they could see the girls on top. They could see him on the ladder. They could see there's no fire. And they told him, you're embarrassing us, they said. Why do you do this? And he said, I'd rather be embarrassed by you and not be embarrassed in front of Hashem. And of course, what he meant was not a physical fire, but he meant there's a fire, a real fire. And he has a taiva, he has a desire. It's a difficult thing to do. And in the heat of the moment, Many times it almost seems impossible to overcome. This is a new challenge. This is not just like a wall that is some challenge in your life. This is the passionate moment. How do you deal with that moment? And you have a second, a split second to make that decision. When Amram was climbing up that ladder, he only had, he was able to save himself. And he had to grab that opportunity with two hands to stop himself from doing the Aveda. Just grab that opportunity and, and do what Hashem wants. And one way to do that is to turn to Hashem and beg for mercy in that moment. Plead with God for mercy on your soul. It's a concept brought down in many, in many holy books. And that's what he's saying, that water, the fire is great, it's difficult, but water could extinguish it. Meaning the water of crying out and begging and, and crying before Hashem to have mercy on you. Water could be difficult because water represents the intellect, the intellectual, the brain versus the heart. That could mean a minus apicursus, like a heresy, a person who struggles with that. So we tell him clouds could bear it. In other words, you have to lift up your eyes to the heaven. Lift up your eyes to the heaven. Don't be such a materialist. right? Many intellectuals, they get lost. They don't realize. Realize your limitation. Lift up your eyes to the heaven and see the glory of Hashem. Allow your mind to expand and see beyond the narrowness that you're focusing on. Okay. The clouds can be difficult. That can mean many times throughout Tanakh, we say that the many sins that we do separate between us and Hashem, like a cloud, like a thick cloud. And, but we say the way to get over that is through spirituality, ruach. Ruach, that means to say a lot of words of Torah, for example. Words, holy words, not just words like a Dvar Torah. Actual words, to heal him. A lot of things a person says, that just a riboy, saying a lot of it could deal with that. I'm picking up speed because we're a little bit over time. It says that the ruach, kasha, the wind could be difficult. Now, what means it says in the Zoyar, that when it says in the verse that, I, that Hashem created a whirlwind to do his bidding, it says in the Zoyar that it's going on the Yitzhahara. And what this refers to is when the Yitzhahara sends disaster our way. It comes with a Rash Godel, with a crazy tumultuous energy pushing us to do the wrong thing. Or a great disaster, a calamity happens in our life. Suddenly it hits us like a whirlwind. But he says, no, the body is even stronger. Hashem gave such resilience to the body. Don't be carried away by the whirlwind. 
stand your ground, the human body could bear those moments. Just accept it and don't allow it to overwhelm you and it's within the realm of possibility. Then it says the body could be difficult. Now what, me, now what that means is a person could be born with with bad character traits and these tendencies and pull, and pull to things. And there are those who are born with a tendency towards addiction. And there's so many negative traits that could be part of our DNA, so to speak, that they're difficult for us to overcome. And the way to fix that is fear. That means live a little bit on your toes. Make yourself a person. If you're like that, you should be a person who lives on your toes. Meaning, be afraid of God. Don't focus. Always keep yourself on your toes. Don't, keep the focus off yourself. And the moment you keep the focus off yourself on, and, and focus rather on other people and what has to get done, slowly but surely, you'll end up changing as a person as well because you're focused on others and you're focused on what has to get done. And this comes from a level of fear of, of making sure that your life is a life which is lived a little bit uh, on your toes, at the edge whatever word we're going to use. But then the Gemara says, Pachat Kasha, living in fear can be very a terrible thing because you're supposed to serve Hashem with joy. And if a person's living with fear of God, that's a big problem. It's a big problem. So he says the answer to that is wine. Wine always represents the primis ha the chasidis, the, the, the Kabbalah, the inner part of the Taita, the secrets of the Taita, Niknas Ya. When you drink wine, all the secrets come out. Because when a person studies the in part, inner part of the Torah, this allows them to reach an awe of God, a fear, but in a healthy way. That they're able to retain their simcha, their joy, and yet have this recognition of the awesomeness. Because when a person, Torah, this allows them to reach an awe of and this means external things in life, like wine, like addiction, there are th- outside forces physical things, not your body per se. That was a different challenge. But there are things which, um, which pull you in a particular way and you feel that your life is defined by those external things. And wine is the prime example. That's why the Gemara gives it. Yayin kasha. Wine, a very difficult thing. They go to sleep and wake up in the morning. In other words, Jews have to realize that when you wake up in the morning, you can be a new person. Stop defining yourself by your past. Start realizing that God created the concept of sleep in order that we should be able to be a new, because we're actually a new person, because God is actually recreating the world. And it's a new day, and it's a new opportunity, and you're not at all defined by your past. And then he concludes that death is the worst thing, because as long as you're alive, you could still do tshuva. You could still do tshuva. However, when a person, when a person, when a person, the uh, when a person passes away, then they're then they can't do tshuva anymore. They can't uh, they can't fix anything anymore. So therefore, every minute is so precious and so dear. And after a person passes away, they rely on their family and other people for their schusim and so on. So this, so today, to summarize what we, what we looked at today, what we looked at today was continuing the theme of tzedakah, and we said that tzedakah was brought, he brought a verse to back it up, but the tzedakah b'chesed, sheyisol eisen, that the Jewish people do, is shalim gadol causes great peace, and praklitin gildailin, and great um, uh, lawyers, so to speak, defense for the Jewish people. And the, we, we went into that a little bit, why that is, because Hashem judges us, neither connected, neither the way we treat others, the way we deal with others, and also the purpose of creation is to be a giver and to unite ourselves with the, with, with the divine, to become one with the divine, to make peace between heaven and earth. And the way that we could be divine is to be like God and to be givers. And that's why the shalim, all of the Torah makes us, causes peace in the world, shalim, because it connects us with the divine. But particularly, Tzedakah causes Shalim Gadol, great peace, because it's the ultimate way that we could be like a divine being, because God is the ultimate Tzedakah giver, because he's the creator of the world. And then we went on with the teaching of Rabbi Yehuda, who says, Sagula, great is Tzedakah that it brings the redemption, and we said that that's the source of our generation. And why does Tzedakah particularly bring the Gula? 
because it uplifts the most amount of sparks of holiness. It uplifts the most amount of the world physically to God because it uplifts our business. It uplifts the, the commerce and all of that. And that is the way when the world is uplifted, that is when Mashiach comes. And then we concluded with a very, very mysterious and Kabbalistic piece of Gemara about asarat barim kashem nibru ba'ilam, that 10 things, difficult things were created in the world. And we said one shot, one way of learning that it's going on different challenges of the Yetzir Hara, of our evil inclination. And But then the Gemara concludes, and this was the connection to the whole Gemara, that Staka is greater than everything, even than death itself. In other words, we defy the rules of nature with Staka. Staka is us going back to the theme of us being a partner with God in creation, it's us being godlike. Therefore, it's even greater than death itself. Don't even let death be a hit on us because we have this connection to the divine, which is Staka, and, and Staka's Matzelis min Hamavis saves from that piece of Gemara um, in the end. Um, Thank you, everyone, uh, for joining. Anybody has a question?